A very good evening to all of you. I welcome you all to the ICANN initiative, the Hindu and Indian Express analysis. We will start the day with the first topic of the day. Today we have six topics, so let's try to cover it a uh, little bit faster. So the first topic is on the basic structure doctrine. So this is a part of your constitution and the parliament. So it comes under your GS syllabus too. So we already know what basic structure doctrine is. So this doctrine evolved under the Keshwan and the Bharti case in which the Supreme Court held that the parliament does not have an unlimited power to amend the, uh, amend the constitution. Supreme Court held that the parliament can amend any part of the constitution but it cannot change or it cannot alter what is called as the basic structure of the constitution. So under this basic structure comes several things be it fundamental rights, directive principles, judicial review, judicial independence, rule of law. So all of these are the various uh, parts of basic structure. So parliament can amend the constitution but it shouldn't be altering the basic structure. So if parliament enacts any law or it comes out with any amendment to the constitution which is altering the basic structure of the constitution, then supreme court can declare such a law, legislation or an amendment as null and void. So this is the basic structure doctrine which we have already seen. What this editorial seeks to analyze is, it critically analyzes this uh, evolution of this particular doctrine by the judiciary itself. So what this whole article argues is that uh, the purpose of evolution of this doctrine was to limit the unlimited power of the parliament to make any amendments to the constitution. But in the process, judiciary has amassed so much of power to define what is a basic structure and in the process, judiciary may have sometimes uh, exceeded its limits and it has come to um, uh, make some judgments which may have been against the spirit of the constitution. So this is the basic essence of this whole article. So now let's uh, go with the discussion. So when we come to the analysis, when we say that the constitution is an evolving document, so even though there is the existence of the basic structure doctrine, still the constitution has been amended and tweaked 104 times till now. So it means a lot of amendments and tweakings have been made into the constitution even when the a basic structure doctrine is existing. And such amendments and tweakings have been made at some times because of some of the judicial pronouncements itself. So two examples are given on this. One is the Right to Education Act which was introduced by the 86th Constitutional Amendment Act. So in this right to education, once it was introduced as a part of article 21A, which is a fundamental right, it became a basic structure of the constitution. So now this whole thing, article 21A is outside the reach of the parliament to be able to amend it. So now what is happening when the right to education was uh, the act began to be implemented, several issues were found in the act. For there are many small private schools, low cost private schools, which will now have to implement this 25 percentage quota for the EWS category under the Right to Education Act. But these are low cost private schools who sustain by the fees that they get from the children. So when they have to accommodate the 25 percent quota without any fees, then they, it is not financially viable for them to sustain. So these low cost private schools which are actually providing access to education at the grassroots level may as well close down because of the implementation of this 25 percentage quota. So there are several aspects of the act which need to be deliberated and based upon the implementation needs to be modified. But however, as RTA has now been put under Article 21A of the Constitution, which is a fundamental right, and fundamental right being a basic structure of the Constitution, now this has become outside the reach of the Parliament to be able to modify it or amend and tweak it. The next example is that of Article 15.5. So Article 15 Clause 5 was introduced with an amendment that happened in 2006. So this amendment said that even private unaided educational institutions will have to implement reservations that are accorded for uh, educationally weaker sections. So this amendment was introduced in 2006 and however if you see that 
making even private unaided institutions educational institutions to implement the reservation may not have been in the spirit of the constitution this may not have been something that was the intention of the uh, our forefathers intention of the framers of the constitution so but still this was done and this was introduced and now article 15.5 has become a basic structure of the constitution because it is a fundamental right so now again this has become outside the reach of the parliament to be able to modify so this is one thing that several amendments and tweakings have been introduced in the constitution even with the existence of the basic structure just because the judiciary had some its own ideology or because of judicial mor morality some of these amendments have been introduced and they have now become outside the reach of the parliament to modify it so this is a very um, risky case where the power has transferred from the parliament to the judiciary and parliament is at least accountable to the people uh, because of the elected representatives but the judiciary the judges are not even elected nor are they responsible or accountable to the people so through the basic structure doctrine the power has just transferred has been just transferred from parliament to the judiciary so the next example is uh, through the basic structure doctrine the uh, legislator or the power uh, the parliament's power has just been replaced by the judicial power for example uh, the classic example of this is the national judicial appointments commission so when the government introduced this bill the national judicial appointments commission bill which is the 99th constitution uh, amendment act as when that was uh, enacted by the parliament the judiciary struck it down as unconstitutional and null and void because this bill goes against the basic structure of judicial independence so judicial independence forms a part of the basic structure of the constitution and this bill and this uh, legislation was going against this basic structure of judicial independence so therefore the judiciary um, declared the njac act as null and void so now what it has essentially uh, happened is the power that was earlier there with the parliament has now been shifted to the judiciary the role of the judiciary was always to impose some checks and balance on the government on the parliament which has a lot of powers to enact uh, legislations but however with the basic structure doctrine the power has now shifted to the courts to the judiciary to be able to decide what is basic structure and what is not what is it that the parliament can amend and what is it that the parliament cannot amend so parliament introduced an amendment related to the judiciary and that was struck down by the judiciary saying that it is a part of the basic structure so therefore this whole analysis uh, aims to just conclude one fact that this basic structure doctrine is a product of the judicial uh, judi it's a judicial creation actually so through this judiciary has given itself a lot of power to decide what is basic structure and what is not what is it that the parliament can touch and what is it that the parliament cannot touch in the constitution so therefore this has given judiciary more more powers and by just taking the powers from the parliament so this is essentially a critical analysis of the basic structure of the constitution so now we move on to the next topic the next topic we are going to discuss is issues related to employment which is a part of your gs3 syllabus so this whole editorial is talking about how will be the future of employment so we are standing at the cusp of fourth industrial revolution where we are talking about internet of things robotics automation big data analytics machine learning and all of this so at this point of time there is going to be some amount of destruction of the jobs and particularly the low and the middle income countries are going to lose out on the jobs creation because most many of the jobs many of the particularly low skilled jobs are going to be automated in the near future so in this case it becomes our responsibility to prepare for this and we need to ensure that while some of the low skill low skilled low quality jobs are being destroyed because of the technological developments we are at the same time we are simultaneously able to create some high quality high skilled high paid jobs so that is what we call as creative destruction of jobs and it is our responsibility to ensure that there is creative destruction of jobs so while some low quality jobs are being destroyed we are also creating some high quality jobs so uh, when we talk about the future this quote by alvin toffler is very important so you can quote them in your answers 
it says our moral responsibility is not to stop the future but to shape it so we have to be prepared for the future because the technological uh, uh, transformation that is happening is e e even in any case it is going to happen so the better you are prepared for it is the better for the country so first we let's understand what this future is going to look like so we will have a future where a lot of technological transformations are going to happen where there is going to be uh, robotics where there is going to be artificial intelligence there's going to be machine learning and automation that will uh, happen in various sectors in the economy and also for india simultaneously we have a very uh, youth um, the population where the majority are youth so we have what is called as a demographic dividend so we need to generate a lot of jobs uh, per year for the youth and also we have seen that the fertility rates among the women are falling and the women are going for uh, higher educations as well so the women labor force participation is also going to increase in the future keeping all this in mind on the one hand the number of people who will aspire for jobs is going to increase but on the other hand because of technological transformations the number of jobs that we can create is going to reduce because a lot of jobs are going to be automated so this is how the future is going to look like and based on this future we have to start preparing ourselves from the present day onwards to tackle this future so therefore we are at this cusp of fourth industrial revolution there is going to be creative destruction of jobs this is how our future is going to look like so how are we going to prepare for it so before we see how we are going to prepare for it let us see some data which will prove that this is how the scenario will look like in the future so the first data is uh, by the international labor organization and uh, this particular data says that uh, nearly 428 million workers in the low and middle income countries like india may not find new jobs because of the automation and the artificial intelligence that is all which are the buzzwords these days so because of these things uh, nearly 428 million workers in the low and the middle income countries will find it very difficult to find new jobs so this is on um, the creation of more jobs and then what will be the impact on the already existing jobs because of the internet of things cloud computing robotics 3d printing digital payments and all that the existing jobs are also going to be impacted because where the humans are uh, present there they are going to be replaced by robots for example the auto industry so the auto industry has been projected that by 2030 it is going to create 65 million jobs but if the assembly line uh, has instead of the low skilled laborers if the assembly line in the auto industry has the robots which is also actually good for the workers because uh, a lot of the work is also very riskier for the workers so, so replacing the workers by the robots is also good but it is going to be result in loss of jobs for these laborers who are actually working on the shop floor so therefore automation is there, uh, going to have an impact on the jobs that are already existing these low skilled low paid manual jobs are going to be replaced by robots so therefore there is going to be destruction of such jobs so this data indicates that it is going to have an impact on the jobs in the future and we have to be prepared for the same so now let's look what is the way forward so we saw uh, some of the important data which can support us in the answer writing we also saw how the future is going to look like where on the one hand there is going to be automation and uh, everything where there is going to be loss of jobs and the, on the other hand there are going to be more and more people who will be demanding more jobs in the future so in such a scenario what should be the way forward so this particular article suggests five dhams so which can be the a good way forward when you're writing answers on how are we going to deal with this destruction of jobs because of uh, the fourth industrial revolution so the first thing is the gyan dham gyan dham means first you have to improve upon your knowledge so as a country we must know we must have a knowledge of all the sectors which are going to be impacted by this uh, fourth industrial revolution we need to have the knowledge of the sectors 
of how the fourth industrial revolution is going to uh, impact the jobs in these sectors what is the future growth trends and in each of these sectors and how we need to create jobs in these sectors so this is a gyan tham where we have to build our own knowledge base uh, sector by sector by analyzing what will be the trends in each sector in the future in as far as the jobs in those sectors are concerned so this is about the gyan tham next is the kaushalya tham this is kaushalya as the name itself suggests is about skilling so once we have figured out the sectors and what will be the trends in each of these sectors in the future under the gyan dham the next thing is for uh, uh, the next thing upon us is for uh, us to skill the people so that uh, they have the enough skills and the right skills to be able to excel in these uh, sectors even uh, in their future trends so for this people will have to be skilled and reskilled and upskilled also so we need more programmers uh, etc more coders uh, tomorrow's because it is going to be more on artificial intelligence and robotics which needs more coding so like that we have to identify the sectors and the trends and then we have to start skilling the people based on these trends so for example now we have the new education policy so such policies should be used to realign how we are going to train and skill our people so that comprehensive training can be provided to people depending upon the trends in each of these sectors so the second kaushalya dham is about skilling reskilling and upskilling people based on the trends in various sectors the third is a suniyojan dham suniyojan dham is about making investments in various uh, um sectors uh, so that they uh, they can all develop and they can all create jobs for example msmes msmes are very important if we talk about how they can bridge the rich poor and the urban uh, rural gap so they are the ones who are who can absorb a lot of labor force so now these msmes will have to be provided with physical and digital infrastructure and tools similarly we have to make investments in the wifi and the network development in the country in that we have to make investments we also have to provide support to the artificial intelligence developer communities in india so these are the various areas where we need to make investments and we need to strengthen these areas so that is about the suniyojan dham next is the samajik nyay dham as the name itself suggests it is about social justice so not every job that is destroyed because of technology is going to give uh, every job that is destroyed is not going to give rise to one new job so therefore there is going to be job losses and people will need social protection so samajik nyay dham says that we have to be prepared for job losses in the future and we have to accordingly plan for the social protection that we are going to provide to the workers to the laborers and all that so when we also talk of samajik nyay or social justice it means that we also need to provide some social services like health and education to them in fact when you talk of health services investing in the health services will itself create a lot of good new jobs health being a service sector and health is one sector where you just cannot replace a healthcare provider by a robot it is not as simple as that so health sector is one sector where new jobs could also be created so that way we need to promote health sector also because new jobs will be created and also because we need to protect we need to provide social protection so this is about the samajik nyay dham and last one is the upkram dham upkram dham is nothing but supporting the various enterprises so that they can excel in their fields for example india already has the third largest ict workforce information and communication technology workforce so we need to empower them to go that one level uh, above and reskill them their employees so that they are able to match the level of artificial intelligence machine learning and all that we have a very good base of engineers we have a great base of mathematicians we already have several coders and programmers of artificial intelligence so all of these enterprises need to be supported we need to support the startups and uh, like that we need to create a supportive conducive environment where the enterprises can flourish so this is about the upkram dham so these are the five dhams which can Uh, prove to be a good way forward when we are talking about destruction of jobs in the future because of technological progress so you may have a question that in the future because of the fourth industrial re- uh, revolution 
we are going to face uh, job losses so how are we going to what steps do we uh, need to take to prepare for the same so this uh, pentagon can serve as a very good reference point for you while writing the answer and you can just elaborate these five points and that will make up a very comprehensive and a very structured answer now we'll move on to the next topic the next topic is on the functioning of the parliament which is a part of your gs2 syllabus uh, this was a very small topic where uh, now that the uh, the parliament has uh, commenced with the session so the government is introducing a number of bills in the parliament uh, and uh, these bills are now being passed in the parliament so on some of these bills uh, they had become a controversy and there was a lot of opposition in the parliament so the opposition was even demanding that uh, these bills that several amendments need to be introduced in these bills and that uh, these bills need to be given to the uh, parliamentary standing committees for further analysis and making a report about it so basically the opposition was uh, against the introduction of these bills and the provisions in these bills so it uh, the opposition was demanding a division of votes on these uh, bills that were introduced in the parliament so usually uh, whenever a bill is introduced and it is being discussed the opposition may demand or anybody for that matter uh, may demand for a division of votes on the bill so whenever a division of votes on any bill is demanded then the presiding officer of the house will have to grant it under the rules of procedure of the house and uh, this means that why it is also important uh, is that whenever a division of votes on a bill is uh, provided for then everybody will get to know clearly what is the position of the political parties on this matter concerning the bill and also what is the position and what are the views of the individual members of the parliament on this particular bill so in order to know this also many times on bills the division of vote is asked for so even if a single member asks for a division of vote it is usually granted by the presiding officer according to the rules of procedure of that house but in this case when the parliament has introduced some of the controversial bills on which there were several opposition by the other political parties in the parliament the deputy chairman of rajya sabha did not accept this uh, Uh, demand for division of votes and he just declared the bills to be passed in the rajya sabha so this shows uh, uh, this can be quoted as an example when you are talking about dilution in the functioning of the effective functioning of the parliament and uh, by uh, uh, not permitting for this division of votes on a particular bill it shows the uh, contraction in the democratic space that is happening within the parliament a parliament which is supposed to be the temple of democracy where that space is not now being given to the opposition members uh, even for a simple thing like the division of votes on a particular bill even that was not uh, uh, permitted or accepted by the presiding officer so the bills were considered to be passed and uh, the presiding officer declared that the bills as passed and he did not heed to the request of the opposition for the division of the votes so this can be cited as an example when you are quoting the uh, when you are writing an answer on functioning of the parliament so how uh, an example to show the dilution or uh, how there has been a fall in the effective functioning of the parliament for that you can cite this recent example uh, only this was the important news in this now we'll move on to the next topic the next topic is related to labor laws and uh, labor laws uh, as a part of the uh, how the labor is regulated in the industrial setup is a part of your gst syllabus and uh, way back in april or may we had already discussed the four uh, codes labor codes that the government was planning to introduce and we had seen the provisions of each of these labor codes and a critical analysis of all but now the government has introduced a new and a fresh bill uh, so Uh, that is why this now this is now in news so a new bill has been introduced by the government in the parliament session now uh, upon the labor so now let's uh, just look into some of the important provisions of this newly introduced bill which is planning to change several laws which are related to labor the first is this uh, is going to change several um, thresholds that have earlier been defined so let us see what are the thresholds under the factories act of 1948 so factories act basically defines factories it says that all those undertakings or all those firms that employs more than 10 workers uh, with the use of electricity or it employs more than 20 workers without the use of electricity then they will be considered as factories 
So once they are considered as factories, then several regulations which are applicable to the factories will start becoming applicable to them. So this is how a factory was defined under the Factories Act of 1948. But now under the newly proposed bill, the government has uh, trying to raise this threshold where it is replacing this 10 by 20 and this 20 by 40. So now it is saying that those undertakings will be called as factories wherein there are more than 20 workers without electricity or uh, more than 40 workers uh, with elect sorry uh, 20 more than 20 workers with electricity and more than 40 workers without electricity. So uh, this is what is a new definition of factories and uh, that has now been proposed by the government in the new bill. So the, and the next is the government is also proposing to raise the thresholds in the Industrial Disputes Act. So what the Industrial Disputes Act mainly says is, so whenever a factory wants to retrench or lay off some of its laborers, then it may have to take the permission of the government before doing so. Because several laborers will be at once losing their jobs, so that may be a concern for the government. So the government must know that the laborers are protected and they are not unnecessarily uh, harassed and they are laid off. So for this, the Industrial Disputes Act earlier said that whenever the factories want to lay off more than 100 workers at, a, at the same time, then they will have to seek permission from the government. Now this 100 has been replaced by 300. The government in its new bill has said that whenever factories aim to retrench more than 300 workers, only then they need to seek the permission of the government. Otherwise, even till 300, their factories can retrench and lay off the workers up to 300 workers without even taking any permission from the government. So this is kind of diluting the uh, job protection for the workers because even 300 workers can now be laid off by the factory and uh, nobody will, nobody can ever say anything. So this is a new threshold under the Industrial Disputes Act. So the first provision is now that under the newly introduced bill, several of these uh, thresholds are being raised. The second important thing under this uh, newly introduced bill is the power to exempt. So what this uh, new bill says is that there are different labor laws and uh, there are several protections that have been given. But however, if the government feels that in the public interest or in the interest of that uh, employment generation and all, if it is needed, then it can exempt any newly established factory or firm from any of the provisions of this bill. They can be exempted. So it says that, uh, for instance, there is an industrial relations bill and this talks about the relations between the employer and the employee, about trade unions, about any grievance redressal or dispute resolution between the employer and the employee and so on. So it says that whenever the government is satisfied that the situation warrants, then it can exempt the newly established uh, factory from the application of any of provisions of this bill. So the factory need not have to uh, comply with any of these provisions. Similarly, there is a bill on occupational safety, which talks about the safety norms and standards, about ventilation, about uh, the safety norms in the factories and all that. So uh, here again, it says that um, when it, uh, if the government so feels, then it can exempt any new factory from the provisions of this uh, occupational safety in the interest of more employment generation. So this power to exempt now has been given to the governments more. The third important provision is, the, uh, is about the women in the labor force. Earlier, uh, the bill held that uh, there were some of the uh, occupations which were considered to be unsafe for women and the earlier bill had allowed uh, the government to prohibit some of these jobs for women thinking that they are very dangerous for the health and safety of women. But this bill now that has been introduced in the parliament, which is the 2020 bill, it says that the government need not prohibit women from employment uh, or under these, uh, of, uh, these kind of jobs, but rather it is up to the factories to provide adequate safeguards to the women so that their health and safety is not compromised. So this is actually a good thing because earlier the legislation outrightly uh, said that the women should not be employed in these, these jobs because these jobs may threaten the safety and health of women. 
but now the freshly introduced bill is saying that uh, these jobs need not be prohibited or women need not be prohibited from these jobs rather it is up to the factories to provide these safeguards for women so that their health and safety is not compromised the last important thing is about the discretion so this bill that has now been introduced in 2020 recently it provides more discretion to the uh, state governments because it says that it is up to the state government to exempt any of the newly established factories uh, from any of the provisions of the bill if it feels that uh, that is ex exempting the newly established factory from these provisions is actually good for more employment generation which means that uh, less things have been specified in the law itself but more discretionary powers are being given to the state governments so these discretionary powers more often than not are used in the interest of the uh, uh, the factory owners only not in the interest of the laborers so that is a usual thing that happens for example we were also studying about the ease of doing index ease of doing business index and how india has improved in it but however it has also led uh, the same uh, has also led to a race to the bottom among various states where they are trying to dilute all these kinds of firm um, regulations and protections that are accorded to the labor so that the industries find it very easy to expand in these states so there is a race to the bottom uh, to be able to score high on the uh, ease of doing business index so we saw how it worked so that is why this discretion that is given to the state governments may actually be used to dilute the protection that is accorded to the labor and on the one hand and to make the factories and the owners more powerful so these these are the important provisions that have been now uh, that is in now uh, now in use under the newly introduced uh, labor bill in the parliament so now we move on to the next topic the next topic is india russia relations which is definitely a part of your international relations topic under your gs2 syllabus so the recent news uh, let's start with the recent news and then we'll delve into the uh, india russia cooperation so the recent news is that um, there was this Caucasus exercise. Uh, this is also in Russia called as uh, in Russian called as Kafkas, Kafkas exercise 2020. So this was a military exercise that was to be carried out along with the other uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization members in Russia. So this exercise, military exercise, was to be held, uh, but India has pulled out of this. So the said reason was that it's because of the COVID-19, but however, uh, we can uh, sense that it is because of the India's tension uh, with China that India has pulled out of this exercise because this exercise was along with the SEO partners of which China is also a member. So uh, because of China, we pulled out of this uh, military exercise of which Russia was a part. So this gives us a hint that uh, the tensions between India and China are actually impacting the India-Russia relations or ties. So this can be quoted as one of the issues when you are talking about India-Russia relations. Uh, one of the issues is the impact of China that uh, the cross-border tension between India and China led us to pulling out of the Caucasus 2020 military exercises has uh, uh, actually is a, a cause of concern because that will amount to our poor relations with Russia. So this is the recent example that is going on. So next let's uh, just look at the broader cooperation between India and Russia. So even uh, when we say that uh, today India might have pulled out of the Caucasus exercise, but it doesn't mean that uh, India-China tensions have actually had any impact on the India-Russia relations. So India-Russia relations have always been strong and they continue to be strong. So in spite of the India-China tensions. So uh, recently the defense ministers also met at Moscow. So that was there and Indra, which is India-Russia uh, naval exercises between the two countries also happened. Then uh, the foreign uh, ministers virtual BRICS meet also happened. So this was a virtual meeting of the BRICS foreign ministers. So that was also there. And um, however, sometimes there have been issues because um, Russia is moving closer to China. Why? Because United States is uh, very hostile towards Russia. So this has made Russia move much closer towards China. On the other hand, India-China issues are uh, always cropping up and there are new tensions between India and China. And this has made India further go further close to United States. And closer ties between India and United States is of course not liked by Russia. 
so because of all these issues sometimes there is tension in the india russia relations but however both the countries realize that this is not a zero sum game so both the countries still are russia is a very important defense partner for us we import a lot of our defense equipments from russia similarly in 2018 we had an informal summit at sochi between india and russia then when we talk of the afghan peace process uh, india and russia are also actively engaged in the afghan peace process so both the countries are very pragmatic in their approach because they feel that this is not a zero sum game okay so whatever actions they are uh, undertaking is not because they don't like the other country but it is because they have their own geopolitical compulsions they have their own geopolitical positions because of which they are taking certain positions for example russia is moving closer towards china not because it loves china but because it is under that compulsion because united states has imposed sanctions on russia and russia's economy needs to sustain for which it needs to have good ties with china so every country because of its geopolitical compulsions is acting in a particular way but otherwise it's not that india and russia are hostile or uh, that there is poor relation between the two countries so both the countries are very pragmatic enough and they know that they need to diversify their portfolio of ties they need to have ties with a number of like minded countries and not just with one or two countries so that is why uh, uh, they are actually uh, you know having ties with many countries but it doesn't mean it is a zero sum game it doesn't mean that if russia is having good relations with china then it doesn't mean that russia can never have good relations with india so both of them are pragmatic uh, partners and uh, they can engage with each other quite well and they can cooperate quite well in spite of the fact that uh, russia is moving close to china and india is moving close to united states so this is where india is also exhibiting its strategic autonomy that it is trying to maintain good relations with the us on the one hand and with russia on the other hand and is also trying to um, ease the border tensions with china so that is how diplomacy actually works also so this is about the india russia relations the last topic is about the fcra analysis yesterday we have already seen a uh, some of the provisions of the recently uh, introduced amendments in the fcra so today we are going to look at uh, two uh, more amendments which are very important so because when you are analyzing a particular bill or an amendment you will need at least five good points to make the analysis so yesterday i think we have already discussed three or four points so today we will be discussing two more points so that you can build a good content on fcra analysis so among the amendments that has been introduced uh, two other uh, amendments the provisions that have been now introduced are very important see one is usually what happens uh, let's say there is a big ngo which is getting foreign funding and there are several small ngos so uh, these smaller ngos have contact with the grassroots usually what happens is this this is a bigger ngo it is getting foreign funding but it does not have access to the grassroots it is not much aware uh, with the grassroots but these are the smaller ngos these smaller ngos don't have access to foreign funding but they are very good with the people and they have a good base at the grassroots so in such a situation what usually happens is the bigger and the smaller ngos they collaborate with one another so whatever foreign funding this big ngo gets is transferred to these smaller ngos in collaboration and that is how the bigger ngo will sublet its work through the smaller ngos and it will do its job at the grassroots so this is usually what happens but in the recently introduced amendment it says that one fcra registered ngo cannot transfer the foreign funding to another ngo so there if this provision kicks in then this whole arrangement will uh, cannot work and then the work of these big ngos and the small ngos will come to a standstill because this ngo does not have a grassroots presence and these ngos don't have access to foreign contribution and if this ngo cannot transfer the uh, foreign funds to these smaller ngos then essentially both of them cannot work so both of them will not be able to provide their services to the grassroots to the people so therefore this is one more uh, problem with the amendment the next important amendment is about the summary enquiry so earlier what happened was uh, if an ngo which has received foreign funding has violated any of the provisions of fcra 
then an enquiry would be done and only after the ngo was found guilty of violation of any of the provisions of uh, this fcra act only then the utilization of foreign funds by that ngo was stopped but now they have introduced a provision of summary enquiry in which summarily the utilization of foreign funds by that ngo can be stopped with the summary enquiry and uh, one need not have to wait till the ngo is found guilty for stopping the utilization so summarily the utilization of foreign funds by the ngo can be stopped so uh, this is one more uh, uh, issue with respect to the fcra amendment so these were the important uh, topics there were other topics of course uh, news that was uh, not really important from the exam point of view so that's it for today thank you